background since Arna is not being very cooperative today. Let's go through just the multiple choice strategies you should take into account tomorrow. This is from Nimsy. This is not my own. However, it is very useful and helpful. So, one of the first strategies you should take is remember the questions are not ordered according to level of difficulty. That being said, question number one is usually a difficulty level one because I don't want you to start the first question and start having anxiety. That doesn't mean, though, that question number two might be more difficult. If you have difficult multiple choice questions and you don't know what to do, circle it, move on, and go back. It is really important to underline keywords and phrases to aid in your assistance. So as we've been doing multiple choice questions together recently, one of the things I've been saying or telling you guys to do is eliminate choices. We've been working on eliminating um, two or three of the choice options to get us down to that final answer. And lastly, determine which case or unit it falls into. Is it a limit, a theorem, a derivative, or an integral? For derivative questions, watch for the product and chain rule. For derivative questions, watch for the product and chain rule. We have a tendency to forget to do both when they're in a single problem. You can't do a U and do it wrong. Like, so sometimes the question doesn't need U substitution and you use it, then it still will work. So look for U sub. And if time allots, check integration questions by taking the derivative. So again, strategy seven, eliminate choices that cannot ever be correct. Strategy eight, watch your time. Make sure not to spend more than two to three minutes per question. If you're spending more than that, move on. Read, read, read carefully. Pay attention to units. Remember, rates of change are in blank per usually time. So if you have time in your units, then it's usually a rate. Remember, only five to six questions are actually calculator active on the calculator multiple choice. There is no penalty for guessing. So if you get to the end and you're down to two minutes and you have no idea, go back and at least fill in a bubble. So some of you in your mock exam just left the multiple choice blank. Don't do that on the AP test. Fill in the bubble. So here we have three graphs. So you have F, F prime, F double prime. It says the graphs are labeled. One of the graphs is F prime, one is F double prime. Which of them following identifies each of the three in correct order? So what you're looking at is the zeros. So we have a zero here and here. We have a single zero here. And we have one, two, three zeros there. So the original graph, we know, could potentially be any of those. But if you look at the first one, it has a zero between zero and one and a zero near two and kind of near three. And then it has an extrema around two. So here, this extrema could kind of match that zero. But conversely, this extrema could kind of match these zeros. 
and vice versa. So then we look at the third graph and we say, here's an extrema, here's an extrema. So that also matches those zeros there. Now let's talk about increase, decrease, and positivity. So this graph is decreasing, which means its derivative would have to be negative. So I don't have any graphs that start fully negative. So that probably tells me that the first graph is the th second derivative. Looking at the next graph, it goes decrease to increase. So if it goes decrease to increase, then I'm looking for negative to positive. This graph here goes negative to positive. So that gives me an idea that 2 could be the first or original, then 3 is the derivative, and 2, or 1 rather, is the final derivative. Do you see like where I was looking at the positive, negative, increase, decrease? Okay? So this is f, f prime, f double prime. Sorry. All right, so number seven. Let's do this one together. Go ahead, take a minute, read it. Okay, so the 500 represents the weight, the 80 represents the cost per pound, since the function is a cost. So it says the cost to shred 500 pounds of a document is $80. That would be if this was the original function, so that would be if it was C of 500. I'm not averaging anything because I'm not dividing 80 by 500, so B is out. C, increasing the weight of documents by 500 pounds will increase the cost to shred the documents by approximately $80. So that doesn't really work. The cost to shred documents is increasing at a rate so, okay, this is a rate, it's positive, $80 per pound when the weight of the documents is 500 pounds. D is the correct answer. Okay. So that kind of goes through each of the strategy, strategies needed. In the meantime, it does look like... Um, my Kahoot is working. These would be calculator questions, but again, we know calculators aren't always needed for every question. If you want scratch paper, I have some sitting on my windowsill. Um, also, Austin, if at any point you want to close that window because it's cold or breezy or whatnot, you can. It just, my room was very warm this morning.
your name doesn't immediately pop up, don't worry, I'm just closing other tabs to try to speed up the internet. So, I froze the screen. Drying. It's going to just hide the multiple choice for a second. I'll put the multiple choice back. I didn't know it was going to do that. All right, so all you had to, but there was no math. So it says the radius of a circle is decreasing. So you're looking for a negative, a rate of 0.1 centimeters per second. 
So it says, in terms of the circumference, what is the rate of change of the area? So again, area equals pi r squared. Circumference equals 2 pi r. So then it says, what is the rate of change of the area? So you found dA dt equals 2 pi r dr dt. They gave you dr dt. That was the point 0.1. And then 2 pi r is circumference. So it was c negative 0.1 for the blue answer choice. What? Gotcha. That's okay. That's why we're doing, you know, random multiple choice questions to sort of try to help with that thought process. Okay, so I'm going to give you a second to look at the graph, and then I'm going to pull up your answer choices. So here's our graph. There's an open circle at A and a point above. So which of the following is false, meaning three of those are true? Okay, good. It is not continuous because the limit from the left equals the limit from the right, but the function does not equal the limit. F of A equals this point and the limit equals that point. Okay, this is a calculator question. It says, let f be the function given by f of x equals 3e to the 2x, and g be the function given by g of x equals 6x cubed. At what value of x do the graphs have parallel tangent lines? And then here are your answer choices. Okay. 
wish I could pause the timer like I can on Blizzards. Yeah, I said I wish I could pause the timer. I'm sorry, I don't know how. All right, so I don't know what you did, but here's what you should have done. After you saw the two problems, if you want graphs to have parallel tangent lines, what do we know about parallel lines? Okay, what do we know about the derivative? It represents the... No, well, yeah, it represents the slope. So what you should do is find f prime, g prime, put those in y1 and y2, and do second trace intersect. How? What was your derivatives, Carson? Did you put in the originals? No. Okay. Because it should be, guys, your derivative should have been 6e to the 2x and 18x squared. All right, Tim. Trip. All right, so the graphs of the functions f, g, and h are shown. Which of the functions f, g, or h have a relative max on the interval a to b? And the interval is open. These are the derivatives. All right, guys, so to have a max, the derivative has to go from positive to negative and cross the x-axis. So you were looking for your zeros, and this had no zeros, so h wasn't an option at all. That left f and g, but this one goes from negative to positive, so that's a min. This has a min and a max. Good. Okay, it says the derivative of the function f is given by the following function. How many critical values does f have from 0 to 10? You get a calculator on this question, guys. Where are the critical values? When the derivative is and does not exist. So plug f prime into your graphing calculator. Change your window to be 0 to 10.
correct answer is three. All right, for those of you that picked four and five, I could kind of see maybe why you thought that, because I also put this in my calculator and looked at the graph. However, if you use the second trace zero, it did not cross. It would have told you second, I did second trace. I looked at the two points to the left and to the right, and I got error, no sign change. You could also have done second trace while in that graph area, and you could have just traced the graph. And as you were tracing the graph, you could have looked for sign changes also, meaning you watched the Y values and just watched to see if Y ever went um, above or below near those points. And if you watched the Ys, they kind of just hovered at like negative 1.29 the whole time. Okay, let f be the function given by f of x equals the absolute value of x. Immediately, you read that, picture that graph in your head. And here are your choices. So this is a calculator question. This is one of those ones that a calculator, I mean, I guess you could graph it, but having its graph doesn't really help you if you know all of the information. So correct answer was one and three. It cannot be differentiable because it has a sharp corner. It is, however, continuous. If f is continuous and capital F prime of x is equal to lowercase f of x, then the integral from 1 to 3 of f of 2x dx can be rewritten as Remember, you're taking into account f prime of x equals f of x. Okay, so the idea here is that you have the integral of f prime 2x dx. My u value was 2x, my du was 2dx. 
So that meant that this was really like one half the integral from one to three of f prime u du. If you anti-derive, the integral and the derivative sort of cancel each other. So you had one half f of u from three to one, replacing the u back with its original. That was two x. So then you had one half f two times three is six minus one half f two times one is two. So you had one half f six minus one half f two for the green answer. Those of you that picked yellow, what did you forget to do? Forgot to account for the one half in the u sub. Okay. Feel like this is helping us for tomorrow? All right, Maddie and Caitlin coming up. Look at that row. Your row's on fire. Sorry, Chase. If a does not equal zero, then the limit as x approaches a of x squared minus a squared over x to the fourth minus this a to the fourth is All right, so good. We have a lot of blue uh, guesses. So the idea was that you had to first factor this. So you got x squared minus a squared is a difference of squares. So you got x minus a, x plus a. The bottom is also a difference of squares. And that became x minus a, x plus a, x squared plus a squared. So the top canceled and became one. The bottom you were left with x squared plus a squared. And then at that point, because you had x squared plus a squared and 1, you could simply plug in, and you got 1 over a squared plus a squared, which gave you 1 over 2a squared. Everybody okay with that? So I didn't write out the factoring part. I have it back here if anybody needs to see it. Okay, so we're talking constant of proportionality with population. 
So it says the population grows. This is a differential equation. You got dy dt equals ky. If the population doubles every 10 years, find k. All right, so we get y equals y, um, y equals y naught e to the kt. So then I just picked two generic things. I said, okay, at time t equals zero, my population is two. At time t equals 10. If it doubles, my population is four. So then that's my y. Two is my y naught e. I'm looking for k, and my time was 10 years. So I just divided both sides by 2, and I got 2 equals e to the k, 10. How do you get rid of an e? You ln both sides. So I got the natural log of 2 equals k, 10, divided by 10, and you got k equals 0 0.069. <laughs> So, not a ton of calc, but calc concepts in terms of knowing what comes before that derivative. So, you could have, if you didn't remember this formula over here, the y equals y naught e to the kt, you could have taken the integral with separation of variables and also done it like that. Okay? Do you want to take your break? Or you want to keep playing and take it when we're done? Okay, well, you got to finish this one then. I'm sorry, because it's going to go into the question. Okay, function is continuous. You're given a table and you're doing a trap sum. They're not equal intervals, so immediately it means you have to set up three trapezoids. It is a calculator question, so once you set them up, you can use your calculator to get your values. Glad we answered before we saw the choices. Good.
Fantastic. Correct answer is 160. So your first trap was from 3. It had a width of 3, so 1 half times 3, and then you added 10 and 30. Your next trap was 1 half times 2, and you added 30 and 40. And your final trap was 1 half times 1, and that was 40 plus 20. So then you added all those sums together, and you got 160. Okay, take four minutes. I'll see you back here at 924. Good. Okay, there it is. Mara, it's a calculator question. Uh, like 60 some seconds. Alright, so volume equals pi r squared. My cross sections were semicircles. So you start with the area of a semicircle. So the area of a semicircle is one half pi r squared. And then volume, you're integrating from 0 to 8 of 1 half pi r squared dr. You had to find your radius. So here's your given function. So I solved mine for y. So you had negative x plus 8 all over 2. You're squaring that, so you could just plug it all in and type it into your graphing calculator using Math 9. Yes? Oh, I thought you had your hand up. No, I did not. I lost my Do you get 67? Yeah. Me too. And I... So I think it just got marked incorrectly. So I'm going to go look up the exact question. So we're going to put a pause on that. Because like I just realized that they had yellow marked. I had 67.02064.
Maddie. I wonder if we just typed it in wrong. Because I just typed it in again and actually got 16. So maybe check how you typed it in. All right, um, so for this one, you had to take your uh, equation, find its derivative. So the original function was f of x equals x to the fourth plus 2x squared. What I did was find my derivative, put it in y1, put this in y2, found their point of intersection, so that point of intersection, and then I used that, and then I went back to the original, plugged in that point of intersection, and that's how you got your equation. job. So again, for this one, it's a lot of calculator. You're typing it in. So if that's the antiderivative and you're given this point, then you can use that initial condition to work backwards and then find f of 9. Okay, if g is a differentiable function and is negative for all real numbers x, and if f prime of x equals blank, which of the following is true?
Okay, good. So it's decreasing when the base is greater than the height. Okay, good. It was one, two, and three. So again, if you had the other ones, you were on the right track. You just missed that all of them were true. So does it have at least two zeros? Yes, we know this because we can look at the values and say, okay, it has to cross at least two times. So based on all of our answers, we all knew that one was true. Number two, the graph has at least one horizontal tangent. That is also true. We know that because the graph has to have at least a curve, and a curve gives a horizontal tangent, and because it's differentiable. And then for C, from 2 to 5, F of C equals 3. That is IBT. And again, if at 2 it's a negative 5, and at 5 it's a positive 5, and it is continuous and differentiable, remember differentiability implies continuity. If it's differentiable, then it's also continuous. Therefore, IVT applies, and this has to occur. And winner takes all.
All right, so, sorry I didn't show you the answers. Congratulations to those of you that got it. Side, in order to do this, this is an area under the curve. You had to set up an integral from k to pi halves of cosine x dx. Find that antiderivative. So the antiderivative of cosine is sine, so you had sine of pi halves minus sine of k. And then you were told that that area was equal to 0.1. And then you just worked backwards. So you subtracted sine of pi halves. Divided by negative 1. And you had the sine of k. equals 0.9, and then to get rid of sine, you took the inverse sine, which gave Our winner is job. All right, so questions, comments, concerns, anything uh, from your uh, AP classroom, those results will get posted today. I have to wait for everybody to turn it in for you to see them. And then um, if you need extra practice or you want anything, I posted on our Fusion all of the handouts and reviews, so you can go look at any and all of those. Um, but that's where we are. Good luck on your physics exam.